Well, Rickover also did the sodium cooled reactor. Like, so it's a, it's, you can't just say that he never tried advanced reactors because he did. He built two sodium cooled beryllium moderated reactors. It must be said that the PWR truly outperformed in reliability and other types, other measures of performance, dozens of other types of reactors that were built uh, and just didn't stand up to the test. Welcome back to Decouple. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Nick Turan, who I believe is uh, scoring a hat trick here in terms of uh, decouple appearances. Um, always hard to keep track of these things. Uh, but Nick, uh, absolute pleasure having you back. Thanks for making the time. Oh, of course. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me back. Love it here. And, and for those who don't know, um, Nick is many things, um, wears many hats. Uh, but I think one of my favorite hats he wears is the What is Nuclear? Uh, website, which is a great source uh, for the nuke nerds out there, a great place to get oriented. Um, I like to highlight your uh, your thorium section because I think that's uh, you know a gateway drug for a lot of people into nuclear, and I think uh, you, you do a good job of uh, uh, not necessarily debunking, but um, you know providing some better context. But Nick, what else do you do? Yeah, so yeah, that's my that's my side gig. Made that website, I don't know, twenty years ago with some friends at University of Michigan, and it's just been. Originally, it was like here's some public information about nuclear, but since then, I just when you have a web page, you can add anything you want to it. So I add things of my own interest. So it got into history and deep dives and all sorts of stuff that's not just for general public. I also have a real job. I am the manager of digital engineering at TerraPower. I've been at TerraPower doing basically sodium cooled fast reactor design for about 15 years at this point. So, you know, in your side gig as a kind of nuclear historian, I mean, you dig up all kinds of cool archival footage, um, neat documents. And uh, I mean, that's that's the hat I'm, I'm looking at exploring with you today. Um, today's episode, we always come up with the zingy uh, titles afterwards. Um, but something along the lines of Rick over uh, and the paper reactor. So we're going to be deep diving um, someone who you know has been called, I guess, am I correct in saying, kind of the godfather of uh, nuclear naval propulsion? Is there is there a better? Yeah, they, I mean, it's the father of the nuclear navy is his sort of official title that I think is um, on his gravestone. Um, but yeah, he has many other titles as well. I mean, you can call him the father of the nuclear power industry worldwide as well. Um, and there's reasons for that. And I mean, the, the decisions he made and things he developed um, echo to today in many ways and so yeah certainly navy for sure but also power and we'll we'll definitely talk about that so that that is the order of the day of the day and you know gentle listeners um i pride myself on not doing obnoxious uh promo um but i would like to uh, really highlight our new Substack, which is where you can find um all of the episodes and really nice episode summaries uh that dylan moon is putting together um, also publishing some uh, standalone content there. So please do come over there, like, subscribe, do your thing, make a pledge. Um, we really, um, you know, looking to make this a truly sustainable product. And if you appreciate Decouple, um, that's the, the place to, uh, to support us. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, do hit the subscribe button. I think we're at 15,000 subscribers. Very happy with that. But as one of our commenters recently noted, that is, we are a criminally undersubscribed YouTube channel. Um, so again, if you like what we do, uh, please do uh, make those those following efforts. It means the world uh, to us at the Decouple team. Um, all right, that's out of the way, Nick. Um, let's dive in. I mean, what a, what a character. Uh, you know, I just did a little bit of background research. Uh, the guy served under President Woodrow up to President Reagan. Uh, he was the longest serving member of the u.s armed forces ever i think he still holds that uh title uh you know known to be a real cantankerous pain in the ass um made lots of enemies made enough friends to you know advance up uh the ladder in terms of uh you know naval rank uh so that he wouldn't be forcibly retired out because i think you can only have so many admirals in the navy um that's just my, you know, quick little overview, but really you're, you're the nuclear historian here. So take it from there. Yeah. Technically amateur nuclear historian, but amateur, the root of amateur is love. So, uh, we'll take it from that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. So what makes like, Rick Orr's obvious, very interesting and many people know some of the stories he's interesting for many reasons. One is that his, he had this incredible ability to deliver. I mean, he undeniably delivered his nuclear development project 
basically on time, on budget. And so that's interesting from like today's perspective. It's like, how did he do it? What were his methods? Um, but then on the other hand, there's all these stories about his curious style. I mean, he he ripped into people. He was extremely rude. He um, ridiculed people in front of large groups. I mean, he like went out of his way almost to make enemies. And I mean, that's just kind of his style. <laughs> Uh, and so, like, how much of that is necessary for nuclear development? Hopefully none, but, like, that's just an interesting part of him. Um, the technical decisions that he personally made against all advice that lasted are are also very interesting. I mean, we're talking about, like, using uranium oxide fuel in a zirconium alloy cladding tube. Like, that was his call, um, and, you know, for, at shipping port, and it lasted every every big reactor does that now. Um, but as you sort of mentioned at the beginning, the thing that kind of got me to look more at, at Rickover was this the famous Rickover paper reactor memo that everybody in nuclear today kind of hears about because everyone says, oh, my reactor is and they basically read off the Rickover memo. And it's the more <laughs> I look at it, I'm like, geez, Rickover really got it right. How did he do that? Like, what did he know? And like the date on the memo is really interesting to I me. Mean, it was June 5th, 19. 53 and like 53 is super early in the in history so like how did he possibly know to write this memo and say like what people say versus what reality is at that time and so like that, that's kind of what got me to dig in early and, and try to understand his background and how he knew that and what was going on at that time so i mean i can I, to, to get started maybe i can just do like a, a really um uh, abbreviated version of the of the Rickover bio and then get into the Nautilus development and so on. I can also, at some point, we can like straight up read parts of the memo. It takes about five minutes to read. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to do that. I'm just going to read a few highlights. But okay, okay. What he calls an academic reactor, a paper reactor, almost always has the following basic characteristics. It is simple. It is small. It is cheap. It is light. It can be built very quickly. It is very flexible in purpose. An omnibus reactor. Very little development is required. It will use mostly off-the-shelf components. The reactor is in the study phase. It's not being built now. Um, I mean, again, how prescient. I, I, as you were saying, 1953, I mean, 1950, when does shipping port come online? Is that? 1958. 58. Yeah. Um, so I'm not even sure if like he's in the era of the paper reactor. I know there was a lot of different reactor styles being tried out. We've talked about the cooperative reactor demonstration project yeah. uh, on previous episodes. Um, I do feel like we live in the age of the paper reactor, but maybe it's the second age. If I could just you know belabor the point and just make a couple you know quote a couple more uh, sections, which I think are just brilliant. Mm. The tools of the academic reactor designer are a piece of paper and a pencil with an eraser. If a mistake is made, it can always be erased and changed. <laughs> if the practical reactor designer errs, he wears the mistake around his neck. It cannot be erased. And then lastly here, I love this one. And it, it just probably is, um, speaks to his cantankerous personality. But yeah. the academic reactor designer is a dilettante. He has, had no, he has not had to assume any real responsibility in connection with his projects. He is free to luxuriate in elegant ideas, the practical shortcomings of which can be relegated to the category of mere technical details. Um, anyway, we're going to definitely post the paper reactor memo in its entirety in the show notes. Uh, but again, I think that gives you a, a bit of a sense and a flavor of the personality um, and you know the visionary that that was Rick over. Um, if you want to make any more comments on the memo, I'm sure we will throughout the episode. But I'm really yeah. going to leave it up to you to sort of determine you know how this whole thing flows yeah, those are definitely some some highlights and we were just joking and my friend a couple of friends now yesterday were talking about it'd be fun to have like a, a plush doll of recover that you like pull the string and it says like <laughs> he's a dilettante free to luxuriate <laughs> like it, there's probably a real market for that kind of thing and also the like memes, you know, we have all sorts of memes inside the industry that we send to each other. It's like Rick picture of Rick Horse is like uses just off the shelf components that you know we sort of send around and Anyway, the, it's just interesting. I've talked to a few other people who are like have broken ground on a nuclear program at this moment. And it's like, hey, how's it going? And like this guy uh, a couple of weeks ago was like, I don't know. I just feel like I'm living the Rick over memo. Like that's like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm transitioning from, you know, the, the paper to the academic. So it's just it's really interesting. So, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk more about that. So how did he so what was going on in 1953? Well, let me give a little um, let me just tell the little the Rick over early life story for a second, if that's OK. And cut me off, um, you know, if I'm going in too much detail or too slow. <laughs> 
but so Rick Armour was born in 1900, um, January 1900 is the easiest. So whatever year it is, that's how old Rick Over was. So he retired in 84. It was 84 years old. Um, he was born in Poland under Russian control and his family was Jewish. And so he uh, was persecuted. It was not a good time to be Jewish in Poland at that time. And so um, after a bunch of persecution, like his family started, his dad came to the U.S., established, got some money, and then sent for his the rest of his family to come over. So Rick Hover went over to a poor, not a slum, but a poor neighborhood in Chicago's West Side as a six-year-old who spoke no English and had had no schooling because Jews couldn't go to school in Poland at that time. So the only education he had was like reading the Torah, like in Hebrew or whatever. Um, and so he was kind of a, he's a six year old, but he also, he had like seen some shit at that point. Like he was kind of like a tough guy. He was small. He was like always a small kind of short kid. Um, and he, he was always that stature. So he had like a lot to, to prove almost like he had to be tough to survive, um, even as a young kid. So he started working a, uh, afternoons and weekends for Western Union. He was a messenger boy. Apparently, there's a picture of him like giving a telegram to like William G. Harding or something as like a little kid. I've never seen the picture. I'd love to find that. Um, and he worked hard and he like learned that like working hard and helping the family was good. And he built this work ethic of like, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to like do good. <laughs> Um, and so he did have like one, his dad knew a guy who was connected and got him a uh, got him a chance to enter the Naval Academy in 1918. And he did not, there's an, there's an entrance exam and he was not well prepared for it. He wasn't well educated, but he was like, I'm doing it. Naval Academy is like my path. Like I don't have any other you know, money for other types of education. Naval Academy pays for your education. So he worked hard. He studied like crazy and he got in as like an alternate into the Naval Academy. So uh, lucky him. And then he was like quarantined for two weeks. And as soon as he started taking classes, he was already way behind. And so he just, he pushed through it. He just, his work ethic was extreme. And that's how he survived, even though he was behind. And he would even, you know, he skipped all the social events. He didn't have friends. Um, he studied, he like studied late at night after taps, which was not, um, not really allowed. And he got in trouble for studying, you know, trying to catch up. But he did it and he ended up graduating like in the top, third of his class, which is important because when you in in the Navy, you your ranking in the academy like matters as you're being promoted and stuff. So off he went um, to um, uh, he went off to sea uh, and he got sea duty on a battleship on a destroyer um, on La Vatet. And he again, he just worked really hard and he impressed his superiors and became the youngest engineer officer in the entire squadron after just a year. So he's here he is just like working. He's like getting more and more. Fear. He's like, if I work hard and like focus and do well and perform, it works for me. Like yeah, I, yeah. I get up there. Meritocracy. Yes, exactly. And so then he goes to the battleship Nevada and he starts working on the electrical systems. He gets really interested in electrical stuff. Um, he has this intense interest and in energy. He achieves results and he has a total disregard for like the niceties and protocol and everything. And that's, that started very early on. Um, he went back to school uh, through the Navy. He got a master's degree in electrical engineering uh, at Columbia and in Annapolis and uh, went back. He decided he wanted to go into submarine duty because, and part of this was like, he's looking to advance and submarine duty is like a little bit more elite. It's There's fewer people. It's easier to make it up the chain. And so part of his reason he was interested in that is because he was looking to get ahead. Like he was ambitious. I mean, let's pause for a second, just because I mean, the submarines are going to be such a big part of the story. Um, and there's a certain amount of bravery to going into submarine duty. I mean, in World War Two, anyway, like highest casualty rates. And, you know, submarines before the dawn of nuclear naval propulsion. Um, I mean, these are scary. These are essentially surface vessels that run a diesel generator, charge batteries, and dive. And, you know, I guess at high energy demands dive for hours, and at low energy demands can stay at under for days. But basically, I think the way to think of them is more that they're surface vessels with the capacity to go underwater um, versus what we what we know about, you know, you know, nuclear powered naval submarines uh, in this day and age. It's it's extraordinary. Yes. Yeah. And that that is certainly relevant because it's it's 
the the difference between a non-nuclear powered submarine and a nuclear powered submarine is transformational. It's a completely different machine. It's the first true submarine is the one that's nuclear powered because it can go under deep and stand there for a long time. So, so let's let's jump into that later. But I just wanted, in terms of like heading into submarine, uh, the submarine service, I mostly just wanted to kind of emphasize kind of the bravery involved in that, or you know that that it's not a not for schmoes. I guess bomber command in World War II is probably similar, but yeah, um, we're probably ahead of ourselves. I don't think we're in World War II just yet. Not not yet. We're nineteen. 1929 we'll get there (laughs) but you're right i mean he and it is and he actually he was brave and he demonstrated it while he was on this submarine the s48 um at one point there was a fire like these things the batteries um and there there was hydrogen involved and if there was a hydrogen leak from the batteries and they started catching on fire it was explosive and catastrophic and many casualties happened because of hydrogen explosions and fires on these submarines there was a fire near the batteries um rickover assumed he was responsible for because it was electrical related he slapped on a gas mask he ran down in there and he found some he like shuffled around found some blankets and threw them on the fire and put out the fire and and saved the ship um and there's another story about at one point someone fell overboard while they were surfaced and uh he dove in and, and saved the mess boy who so he's this like kind of heroic character who's like he just doesn't care he does you know he disregards every so he makes all these enemies but he also is like really this he has strong excellence and his leadership really like appreciates him because he gets stuff done. Um, okay. Still going on. At one point he met some scientists, some scientists came aboard to study some terrestrial gravity stuff. And he spent a lot of time like hanging out with those scientists and hearing from them. And he became interested more in like the scientific aspects of stuff. He was like intellectually stimulated by that. And that, that was something of interest. Um, anyway, he then in the thirties, he, so, so all this time, he's like been on ships for many years. He's in the engine rooms. He's feeling equipment. He knows what it sounds like. And he knows like the, the specifications. Like when you're on a submarine, like safety and specs and like building things that don't fail, reliability really matters because like these, you are underwater. Like um, so that and that's also important as, as we'll get to when we go to, to nuclear and so, power. So he's more involved in like it's I think less strategy and tactics. I mean, yeah. more broadly over his entire career, I'm not sure about this stage, than on uh, – so he focuses on sort of, you know, the, the machinery of the ships that he's on and making sure that they're as safe as humanly possible and run well and reliably. He's yeah. less focused, you know, at this point in his career and I think for the length of his career on, okay, like let's, let's really think through, you know, yep. submarine strategy, for yeah, instance. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah, he's like very much on the like machinery side of it. Keep it running nicely. So anyway, he um, he gets off the submarine, he gets a desk job for a while at the Inspector of Naval Material in Philadelphia. And he this is when he starts learning about like the vendors of the world, people who supply material to the Navy for shipbuilding. And he starts really focusing on like their specifications and their schedules. And this is where he builds like another key element of his capabilities, which is that he like understands American industry and he has... He, he like knows the executives and he can talk to them. And he also has like the force of the Navy behind him, which is a massive customer of all this industry. So he can go in there and say like, I need it done like this. And they're like, well, we don't know. But he's like, well, then the Navy will never buy anything from you. So he's he gets this power and he, he starts learning about like logistics and, and materials. Um, so let's, I'll try to speed up at one point he did get, he got his only command of, they gave him command. He really, you know, you're supposed to get command as you're going up. He got command of a, like a rust bucket minesweeper called the Finch. They were like, here you go. Here's your command. And he's like, okay, I'll take it. And he tried to clean it up and, and so on. But, um, Anyway, he he didn't do that for so that, long. That would be over like not a lot of men. Like a minesweeper is not not like a massive crew or anything. No, no, it's it. like a yeah. little. It was sort of like an embarrassment. But he he just like took it. Like there were a few times when people tried to hold him down, and he was like, "I'll just make it the best I can." Right. But anyway, he there's this program called Engineering Duty Only EDO, and he just he changed his career and decided to become an EDO officer, which is like again, it's there's they're elite. There's a higher you're almost guaranteed to retire as a commander, um, and it's like he was interested in engineering, and they they're focused on like the stuff we were talking about, like building the ships, making them reliable, powering the ships, and so on. So he goes into that program. Um, and he gets eventually through that, he becomes the assistant head of the electrical se- section at Bureau of Ships. And so here he's like more involved in designing equipment, ordering equipment, uh, making things good. Uh, and I mean, World War II is starting at this point. He's at the Bureau of Ships and he becomes obsessed with um, battle damage. 
So he starts like in one year, he flew 100,000 miles to um, see every single battle damage ship he could. And he read every single battle report. And he was just shocked at how poorly these ships, especially the electrical equipment, stood up to the actual impacts and shocks of war. And so he became, he started a major shock test program where they would like anchor ships and blow off um, little um, depth charges and see an instrument and see how far everything fell. And he learned that you have to test things at full scale, real prototypes, all this stuff. And this is all, again, relevant for nuclear. And like, there's, a, uh, there's other stories, uh, there's infinity stories, so I can't tell them all. But like, at one point, an, uh, a vendor came in and handed him a shock proof redesigned instrument. And Rick over walked out of his office, looked at it silently. And he turned around and just threw it at a metal radiator and it shattered into a million pieces. And Rick Over just turned around and walked back into his office without saying anything. So like, he's just this, again, a real character. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So World War II happens. I'm going to skip some stuff. Um, and he's still at this, this Bureau of Ships. The Navy's becoming interested in this concept. Obviously, nuclear power is a thing. In, in the Manhattan Project, there is discussion of nuclear powered submarines and aircraft. Um, before Recover gets involved. And what, like at what, at what stage of the project? You think they'd be kind of singularly focused on building a bomb in two years and 10 months, but... Yeah, they, it was like brief discussions. They were like, hey, maybe okay. later we could power an airplane. Maybe later we could power a submarine. And those were, it was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. We'll deal with that after we get this bomb. Right. So it was, there was and, no real work done during... And, and I mean, like at that point, again, and maybe I'm skipping ahead, but like a nuclear reactor is a pile. Like it's a whole, I mean, <clears throat> a bunch of graphite blocks and you're just trying to have a sustained chain reaction to run experiments or make plutonium, I guess, right? Yes, yes. And it's low, it's room temperature effectively. And so, yeah, there's a big difference in like making usable work out of a nuclear reactor versus the the, the early piles that people had, which were room temperature, no pressure, um, literally once through cooling, like the Columbia River comes in, goes past the fuel, <laughs> goes back out to the Columbia River, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, so yes, there's, there's big differences. And, and we're there. I mean, we can get into like at this point. So right after the war, uh, skipping over, like Rick Hover gets sent to Oak Ridge to learn about nuclear power with a small group of, um, of a couple other naval officers. Oak Ridge basically had this training program, a classified training program that became the prototype for all nuclear engineering programs eventually. But at that time in like 1946, Rick Hover was sent there to learn about nuclear. He was put on a team that was using, that was working on a power reactor for commercial power um, called the Daniels Pile. It was a high temperature gas cooled reactor, pebble bed, helium coolant. And that was wow. intended to be like the first reactor that would make power. And Rick Hover was like, this is cool. And he started asking questions and learning about it. He sort of made himself in charge of the naval group, as they called themselves. So, so you're, you're, just, just to pause you for a second, you're saying one of the first uh, power reactors ever conceived was a pebble bed, helium-cooled, high-temperature gas reactor. Yes, with beryllium oxide moderator and it highly enriched uranium. <laughs> I thought that was like the newest kid on the blog. That's certainly like no, that's, no, that's that the was, perspective that was we this have guy, in terms of this chemist like Farrington Daniels sort of came up with it and thought it would be the thing. But no one like it was that was definitely one of the very first uh, like uh, efforts to build a, a land based power plant. Um, but the, the, the oh, sorry. Um, but the, the Atomic Energy Commission, nobody thought it was serious. Like the fuel alone was like 10 times more expensive than coal. It was using highly enriched uranium. When Rickover was looking at it and asking engineering questions, I mean, these guys were scientists. And he started asking like engineering questions like, how is this blower designed? Like, how is it, what's, uh, what's the leak rate on this? And nobody knew anything about it. And the equipment was very large. And so Rickover very quickly... Um, realized that that thing was not at all what they needed for a submarine. And he also got a really big skepticism towards scientists in general. He was like, these scientists don't know the first thing about real engineering. And so he, he appreciated scientists in a way, but he also was highly skeptical of them and realized that he was going to have to do all the engineering on his own. So uh, they, they basically gave up on the I gave up on thinking about that um, that gas cooled reactor, and that that reactor got canceled eventually. But at that time, he met Alvin Weinberg, who told him that hey, you could use pressurized water reactor, which Alvin Weinberg had sort of invented um, and thought about during the war a little bit. 
And Rick Over was like, hmm, that's interesting. And so he was more interested in that pressurized water reactor. And there was also a liquid metal cooled reactor concept that was also even more interesting. And Rick Over was primarily interested in the liquid sodium metal cooled reactor at first. Um, so anyway, but then, but no one in the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission or the Navy even thought um, that a submarine could be built anytime soon. They all thought it was like a 15 year project. So they all just thought he was crazy when he was saying like, I could do this in like five years, which is what he was kind of talking and, about. And what, what were the kind of primary challenges that were identified? Again, I guess we're talking, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, is it Faraday? Sorry, I'm, I'm blanking mm. again. Farrington Downing. Farrington, Farrington Daniels, Daniels not yeah. Faraday. Yeah. Um, you know, like they're, they're looking at alternatives to these big, you know, um, graphite piles. Yeah. Um, but the idea, like, uh, why do people think it's so, uh, you know, unimaginable that you're going to do this quickly, get, get a reactor into a submarine hull? I think the, the answer is kind of obvious here, but what am I not thinking about? Yeah, I mean, there's just, there was technology that just didn't exist. Like in order to, again, the, the reactors that existed were room temperature and had aluminum cladding around fuel. There were gigantic rooms full of things. So you have to first like shrink the whole thing down to fit it into a submarine. You then have to go to high enough temperature and pressure that you can make reasonable amounts of, of heat that can do some kind of work, like make steam to, to spin a, a screw that can propel the, the submarine. Um, you need it to have endurance, like it has to be reliable. None of the reactors that were reliable, um, you had to have it be not just reliable, but extremely reliable. Like if it stops, the crew dies. Like it's, it's not something that can um, shut down on a whim or whatever. Um, and so there's just like a reliability issue. There's no one knows what kind of metal could even be used in that condition. There's no known metal at this time that can go to high temperature that doesn't absorb neutrons and is strong enough to sort of hold the fuel in. And so they have to like come up with a metal like no one. So there's all these metallurgists involved and they did find one zirconium, uh, but they, they developed that. And I mean, that's jumping ahead a little bit. Um, at first, no one thought zirconium was a good material because it was absorbing neutrons. But they found out that like different batches of zirconium absorb neutrons differently. And eventually, the physicists discovered that there's a hafnium impurity. Hafnium is a very strong neutron absorber. So once they figured that out, they had like a shoebox of zirconium in the world. And they were like, okay, we need 30,000 kilograms of zirconium for the submarine prototype. And they built an industry. And like Rickover went to business manufacturing a very pure reactor grade zirconium so that was like one of the technologies that had to be developed for this can, can he be thought of as like the general groves of the uh you know naval propul nuclear propulsion yeah uh, i mean that's yeah it's like, obviously he, two distinct strong characters but like i'm just trying to find some categories i mean he was even of. he was more of he was even more of a dictator like he um first thing he had to realize he realized we need people who knew stuff so he like got more people to the school like training was the first couple of years in the like really late 40s he was like let's train up naval officers who can understand this stuff so he got people to go to oak ridge he sent people to mit and they built two training programs and then like he had this group of people who he trusted who followed him and were very smart and like he was like more of a dictator like he didn't um he didn't really ask. He, he knew he couldn't do everything himself, but he trained people and got them into his cult almost and then just like managed through them. He was like this king of, of the Naval Reactors program. Eventually, again, there was this and we probably don't have time to go through it, but like he didn't nobody had any no one thought he could do it and there was no um, support for it or anything. But then like various things happened, like the Russians made a nuclear bomb. Um, Sputnik was being worked on. Um, and eventually, like, things shifted. And there were, like, some people, um, Edward Teller wrote a letter in 1947 that said, hey, I met this guy Rick Over and his people, and, like, you should give them rope. Like, you should let them do what they want. Like, they are onto something. And so, um, and eventually Rick Over, well, so the Navy still didn't like him. The Navy put him... <laughs> They gave him a new office that was literally in like a converted ladies room. It had like a wash base. And I don't know if that's for the Top Gun ladies room. <laughs> but eventually he like went over his management and he wrote to the chief of naval operations, Nimitz, who was a submariner. And he said like, this is the power of a nuclear powered submarine. And Nimitz was like, oh, wow, like that's actually awesome. And he from the top, so by, by bypassing his management chain and going to the very top and saying like, look how important this is. 
that eventually was like, okay, let's do a naval program and let's put Rick over in charge, which. Okay. So again, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense here of, I mean, we just talked about, you know, prior to nuclear submarines, you kind of had a surface vessel that could go underwater for a little while. But in terms of what's being theorized here, in terms of capabilities, obviously you can stay underwater until you run out of food. Um, but for very long deployments, ultimately the Nautilus, I think, circumnavigates the globe. I'm not sure if it's all underwater. It goes under the, the North Pole, you know, Northwest Passage, all that kind of jazz. But what has been conceived of tactically here? Because you mentioned Sputnik, um, which starts to bring in the era of the intercontinental ballistic missile. And obviously that's, you know, there's attack submarines and there's, there's ICBM submarines nowadays. Um, was that uh, foreseen or um, like what sort of capabilities were were being unlocked here that that got, you know, Teller's attention or got Nimitz's attention? Yeah, I mean, the 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 recent experience with submarines in World War Two, where the Germans just like dominated the sea for a while with their submarines, I think was like the main thing it was like control of the seas and logistics over the seas through submarine warfare was the like most interesting thing they weren't. I don't think they were really thinking about ballistic missiles too much at the time. It was just like, if you have submarine, I mean, the advantage of nuclear isn't just that it can run for a long time, but it like, it doesn't need oxygen. The diesel, you know, you need a snorkel that pulls in oxygen and like has exhaust. So to not need any oxygen for combustion, um, you can, yeah, uh, distill your own fresh water. Like you said, it lasts till you, you run out of, um, run out of food. So yeah, it's just this like utter dominance of, the entire sea with this like totally new weapon that like can go unlimited range wherever it needs to be and just pop up and take out any ship and no one can catch it because it's faster than everything else. Like it's just a, it's like the ultimate weapon. So uh, in my conversation with uh, Professor Alex Wellerstein, uh, great episodes there. We yeah. got to talk about the bomb. We got to talk some more about the bomb. Um, but <clears throat> I think it was him. And I mean, many commentators have talked about this, like after the bomb is dropped and after World War II, there's a military industrial complex. And all the divisions of the military are trying to soak up as much money as possible. And Bomber Command and, and the U.S. Air Force, first with um, you know strategic bombers and later with uh, you know missile command, um, are are absorbing a lot of that funding. And I think the Navy is trying to look for ways to you know get some allocations. Um, and it strikes me that um, that's part of the the interest here. Is that also playing a role? Just the kind of politics of you know post war military funding. I don't I have not come across that in the things that I've been reading as a major priority. Like the mm -hmm. the Navy was spending plenty of money on other upgrades and, and built ships and stuff. But the submarine thing just wasn't really on their radar. Um, so it, that could be. And they ended up I mean, we ended up spending like a billion dollars. on Like they, they be, the Navy stuff. becomes relevant in terms of its use of nuclear weapons yeah. because of like not because of any other. Like it's truly the nuclear submarine and, and the, uh, you know, its potential to deliver nuclear missiles, which, again, comes comes later down the yeah. road here. OK, so let, yeah, I'll and, stop interrupting. you. No, but. it's it's true. I mean, in the Air Force was ahead, like the Air Force, the nuclear powered airplane was like predates the nuclear powered submarine as a major program. Like it was under study uh, before we were like really got into the submarine stuff. Of course, that didn't do as well. We, we talked about a high temperature gas reactor as one of the first ideas for, you know, I guess, power generation potentially for a nuclear sub and a molten salt reactor, <laughs> you know, the most futuristic reactor we can imagine in this day and age, at least according to Andrew Yang. Was was the aircraft uh, experiment? Yeah, aircraft reactor experiment, and they also had the solid fuel one. The ones out in Idaho uh, in the parking lot; those were solid fuel, air cooled ones. But yes, the aircraft reactor experiment in Oak Ridge was molten salt. Very exciting stuff. So he gets approval, like in 1948. He says, "I will have a nuclear powered submarine launch January 1st, 1955." So like many years in advance, he hasn't started the program or anything. And so then he like gets serious. <laughs> And he gets the he gets the the navy says like we need this this is a military necessity finally they they, they took forever to say that um, and so they go off and they decide to like build a prototype and do all the choices and so again they do just like in the Manhattan Project it's a two prong approach they have the pressurized water reactor as their primary hope and they have the liquid metal sodium cooled reactor as the secondary that's done by GE so it's like Westinghouse is contracted for the pressurized water one ge is contracted for the liquid metal one and there's a bunch of like side stories there about how ge was working on a power reactor for commercial stuff um and even before nuclear ge he had done a liquid metal heat transfer study big contract just doing liquid metal heat transfer non-nuclear and that's what got them started that's why they were the um liquid metal people and westinghouse had done a pressurized water heat transfer study again pre-nuclear and that sort of primed them to be the ones with the pwr 
So um, Rick Hofer's plan is to build land prototypes. Um, all the scientists, everybody in the program said, let's just make a big building and we'll put all the components laid out and we'll test them all and shake it all down. And Rick Hofer said, no, you must put it in a submarine hull in a tank of water. And they were like, are you crazy? It'll be too small. We won't be able to see anything. Nobody agreed with him. And he's like, no, we need to do it so that um, we like learn all the things needed to pack it in there. Because if you do it your way or you spread it all out, that's going to delay the program by five years. And since he wanted to move fast, he was like, no, build the large, the, the full scale, like actual system prototype. And he made, he was real stickler about it. He was like, if there's a coffee pot in the, you know, he's like, that coffee pot wouldn't be in the submarine. So get it out of here. <laughs> like he was very like, and I mean, the water was important uh, because he wanted, no one knew how the radiation would like go uh, out of the hull and then scatter back in. And so for the shielding design, that was a big unknown. Like how do you shield a submarine was one of the major, another technology development that no one knew how to answer. He, he asked Ted Rockwell, he's like, how do you, he's like, can you give me the specs for the shield that would prevent um, radiation from hitting anybody on the sub? And uh, no, no one knew how to do it. So they had to go learn. And is that shielding water? It's many things. It's it's water. Water has no cracks is one thing he used to say. So there's water, but there's also other stuff like lead and concrete and steel, or lead and steel, at least. Um, so anyway, and then Rickover was like, hey, or some people came and said, Rickover, um, we could probably have more relaxed radiation limits than the civilians have right now because we're military. So you can like dose those military guys a little bit more. No big deal. It's probably conservative. And Rickover was like, hell no, I want to do better than the civilian. Like, I want this shield. And, you know, he, they did some trade-offs and he's like, no, I want the, I want no one on that ship getting any more than the civilians allowed to. So he was very respectful of like radiation. He didn't, he was not reckless. He was very like safety oriented. And again, this is where, when, when there's like these reliability issues, he's already been on a submarine for years. He knows if like anything goes wrong or anything breaks, he's like, everyone's in trouble. They find numerous technical problems, like the valves they're they're testing um, are sticky. They're chained. They aren't reliable. They move up and down. Um, when they first put pressurized hot water in this equipment, like pumps running in pressurized hot water, never been done. Um, it, it all everything was turning like oozy and black and gooey and gumming up all the valves. And they realized they had this major chemistry control problem. And the only solution was to put like an overpressure of hydrogen in the space with the water. And, and Rick was like, Ew, hydrogen. He had this experience with hydrogen fires. But they did it like and that's what ended up uh, fixing the chemistry issue for then. We've since we've we have better chemical treatment. We don't have to use hydrogen gas anymore, but that was like a scary thing they did. Anyway, so they build this thing, this prototype, this the sodium thermal reactor in Idaho. And March 30th, 1953, it goes critical. May 31st, it um, first made real power to turn the screw. And he goes out and he looks at it spinning. Uh, and he's that's and they like nod their heads silently. Like, so this, this is, is the not first the PWR. Time. This is the this is the sodium. No, model. sorry. This is the pro land prototype of the PWR came. From okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah in yeah. Idaho, right. um, the 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 liquid metal prototype was being built in this giant dome in New York, uh, at at the at the lab there in New York. So anyway, it's been seven years seven years since Rick Hover first heard about nuclear power, and now he's looking at this screw doing a full power. Um, a full power uh, turn of the screw. And that's, um, and then like right after that, that thing did a simulated transatlantic run. So it ran at the power necessary to like run uh, the whole time all the way across the Atlantic. And so uh, it, I mean, it, this is, this is the PWR version. Yes, it worked okay. great. It was awesome. And I mean, it was hard. They developed all sorts of technology, the fuel, the, the zirconium, they got all the manufacturers lined up. They fixed all the reliability issues with all the valves and the pumps and the uh, heat exchangers and so on. Meanwhile, yeah, the, the sodium-cooled Seawolf prototype was also under development and was hap was happening, but a little bit delayed um, as the backup. Um, it did eventually run. I mean, they got it to work, and again, jumping ahead a little bit, but it was pretty unreliable. Um, Rick Hover has all these quotes about how he, like, hates sodium in a submarine. Like, submarine sodium cool and is, like, the stupidest thing ever. And if the, there's a great quote that's like, if the ocean were made of sodium, some damn fool of an engineer would propose a water-cooled reactor, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good one. But I mean, he did like it at first because it was going to be higher thermal efficiency. You could pump sodium with no moving parts electromagnetically. But when he saw the like maintenance and reliability issues in a submarine environment, he realized that it was, it was just not a, an option. And 
Can you can you go a little deeper into that? Like I also understand, yeah, maintenance. Uh, like it's it's a lot more radioactive. If there's a pipe break, it's a you know. Yeah. What, what so, are, yeah. Well, so um, yeah, one thing the radiation, like um, every material, if it's in if neutrons are going into it, it activates and is, becomes radioactive and then gives off that radiation profile. It happens in water, like water activates and gives out these strong gamma rays, but those gamma rays have a very short half-life, like less than a minute. So like you shut that reactor down, you wait three minutes and you can go near any of the primary coolant pipes. And that's why a boiling water reactor with radioactive water moving through the turbine is a possibility. Well, yes, but that's why the turbine shielded. So like there is radiation coming out of there. And so if you want to go do maintenance on, you've got to shut down, but you don't have to wait long. Whereas with sodium, same thing happens, but the, um, the radiation has a much longer half-life. So it's like days. Um, so you, when you shut down a sodium-cooled reactor, all that uh, primary sodium is super radioactive and you can't really go close to it or do anything on it until you wait like a couple weeks to get for it to like uh, reduce in radiation due to its activation. So that's one problem, just like the radiation characteristics are harder. And then, I mean, yeah, like a water leak is kind of a thing that submarines know about already. And like people can deal with water coming out. Um, but a sodium leak is a much different thing because it's chemically reactive. So you have to keep it either double piped or you somehow have the environment inerted. So there's no oxygen around to, or, and you can't let it mix with water. But you have a sodium water heat exchanger, which is you know, just a scary thing. You also have, it's just a higher performance reactor in the sense that it has higher temperatures, which mean the material science is harder. There's more, uh, th there's more like, in the, they had the superheater section that made it very high efficiency, but the tubes kept plugging because of corrosion and so on. And so just being at higher temperature is just harder from a material science point of view. And so those, they plugged all sorts of superheater um, tubes and they could do it, but it was very hard to work on. I've got, there's some quotes about um, sodium in here somewhere, but I'll, I'll pull those out later. Yeah, anyway, no, I, love, just, I love the one if the ocean was made out of sodium, some damn fool would yeah, come yeah, up with yeah, the water that's a water reactor. Anyway, so eventually, I mean, that thing ran, the Seawolf ran 60,000 miles on a sodium-cooled reactor. Like, it was feasible. It was just a pain in the ass. And Rick Over eventually said, nope, take it. They ripped out the sodium-cooled reactor and they put a PWR in it, in that same submarine. So they actually like swapped out the, the reactor in the submarine and then launched the submarine with the PWR, which is kind of crazy. Just for point of comparison, I mean, the Russian uh, nuclear Navy, um, they did lead cooled. Did they do sodium cooled? No, they yeah, they did lead bismuth cooled, but no, they didn't do sodium. They did a bunch of lead cooled ones. They did one the uh, big one with two reactors that were lead cooled and then a bunch of these little um, titanium hulled super fast alpha class ones um and they had similar like just maintenance issues there's all sorts of well the the we were just talking about the i just learned more recently about the the big one um k27 was it soviet submarine k27 which had a meltdown like while operating and the liquid fuel the liquefied fuel circulated in the primary and dosed a bunch of people and gave and killed nine people from radiation dose um, in that one and then the alphas there's all these stories about how they, you just couldn't turn them off because if you ever turn off the reactor like the lead, the lead bismuth would like solidify and it caused all these problems so they would they had them like docked with like big steam pipes going up with like a shore station, like providing steam to it to keep them warm. And eventually they just never turned off the reactors. They were super high performance reactors, faster than anything. They could outrun torpedoes like mm. the, the U.S. Really? was like terrified of them because of their capability. But also um, they were a pain in the ass. So it's it's a trade off like they're badass, but they aren't very reliable. <laughs> And and I mean and this is this is one sort of testament to Rick Over's character and uh, you know sense of uh, duty perfectionism. There has not been a single nuclear uh, I don't know how to define it incident. I guess that means no core damage resulting in the release of fission products in the history of the millions and millions of hours of nuclear naval operations. And you can't say the same thing about the the Ruskies. Is that because of the different reactor styles they chose are just a different safety culture. Like, I, it's, it's probably the, a different safety culture. I mean, the, a lot of Soviet reactors were PWRs as well, and they had a lot more safety issues and losses of life. So yes, there was like a much stricter and more serious focus on quality specifications, reliability in the U S. And so, yeah, that, that is reflected, I think in the safety record, it's like dramatically different, like how many lives have been lost in the two different programs. Um, 
we did we did we have lost nuclear powered submarines the thresher and the scorpion um both lost um generally considered for non-nuclear power reasons and yeah the like the reactors aren't leaking as far as we know um we go down and check them every once in a while but like there is i mean there's some like elements of nuclear or of the reactor um at least in the the thresher like basically the something shorted out probably scrammed the reactor and the person running it was like a trainee a, a fresh grad um, and he just followed the procedure somewhat blindly. Like after the reactor scrammed, you could turn it back on quickly, but the procedure said like you're supposed to close these big isolation valves. And they were at test depth. They were really deep. And he closed these big isolation valves, which made it like impossible to turn the reactor back on or even use some of the extra steam to propel them back up. Um, and so like the reactor was kind of down for the count for at least 10 minutes. And at which point they were like, okay, no problem. We'll blow the ballast tanks. And so the ballast tanks would then, you know, bring you back up. But the ballast tanks had a flaw, which was like at that depth, when they, when the air started flowing through, there was like a grid and it iced up. And so the, the grid iced up and blocked the ballast tanks. And so there was no ballast displacement. And so the, the ship just sank and imploded. So it's, it's not really like you could, you could argue that like if the training was better or whatever, but like the guy who who that that guy was a trainee of a much more experienced officer who would have said, "If that happened to me, I never would have closed those valves," even though that's what the procedure said. And Rickover said, "We don't train people to follow procedure; we train people to think in you know independently." And like if you're a test depth, the only way up is to propel yourself back up. Of course, they you don't expect the ballast tanks to fail, but they did anyway. So. That's kind of what happened there. But yeah, that's like, and then the Scorpion is like a much more, the Navy's like, we don't know what happened. There was an explosion. Like they may know, but no one's ever like, we don't really know what happened. It looks more like there was damage in the uh, torpedo bay. Like there's theories like the torpedo was launched and it came around and hit them. And there's all sorts of crazy theories. It's like not well known, but it doesn't look like it's a reactor thing. And you're right that there's no, um, there's no like radiation spewing around. There's no, they measure uranium around there and they don't see any. Anyway, but yes, his his safety culture was quite good. I mean, and on that point, it's kind of interesting to, to say, like, he was proud that he just threw away procedures. Like, the Navy had procedures and guidelines that you were supposed to follow. And he was like, oh, I threw all those away. I banned anybody from having naval procedures in the office. I, like, made him burn the book, which is kind of <laughs> interesting because... That like goes that flies in the face of like current nuclear safety culture, which is like just follow the procedure every time. And he's more like I think he, I don't know if he has different opinions on this depending on if he trusts the person or not. Like he wanted when later when he built shipping port and was handing it over to the utility Duquesne, he like didn't want to transfer control because he didn't trust the utility to run it. But then they like wrote all these procedures and he made sure that they would follow the procedures. But for his own people, he was like, no, we don't want procedures. Like I you you do intense training. Uh, you become a genius in this area and that's how you're going to run things. We'll have some procedures, but they're more like guidelines is kind of right. the pirate's code. Is, yeah, you exactly. Remember the pirate's code? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Like now in the nuclear industry, it's like all, it's like obsession over procedures. And he even warned about this. He's like, if you have so many procedures that the process takes longer than it should, then you're just wasting everybody's time and money and right. you need to just be smart enough to just go make it happen. But in order to do that, you have to be trained. And he became absolutely obsessed with like education. Later in his life, he wrote like several books about the American education system failing and like how we have to fix education. He was like obsessed with how horrible our education system was. I know a couple of things I was reading just in terms of, again, of his leadership style. Um, he had, a, I guess, a quote, you know, the hierarchy of the mind. He, he banned uniforms in his, uh, in his office. He, I think he wore one like, I mean, he, very infrequently, I think it was... <laughs> The main time he wore like his full uniform was to go meet with Ronald Reagan, who's yeah. I think, secretary of the Navy had had him fired. And Ronald sort of said, hey, you know, you could be an advisor. And he basically told him to get stuffed. Um, and Rick over did. Um, but yeah, like he it's it's reminiscent, you know, in medicine. We borrow a lot of our safety culture from um, the nuclear industry and from the military. And, you know, when you think about the Tenerife aviation accident where, you know, a captain overrode his, you know, flight engineer and co-pilot because he was impatient to get out of some bad weather and collided his jumbo jet into another jumbo jet, killing more than 500 people. It had a lot to do with with hierarchy. And so, you know, really interesting that he didn't want, you know, a junior engineer to feel like they could interrupt like Lord Mountbatten when he came to visit. Um, so, you know, totally um, 
kind of insurgent leadership style is interesting. Yeah. And I mean, that definitely was like completely against this naval, you know, the military idea is like you follow orders. And he was so opposed to that and demanded that out of people. I mean, and when he was up for being chosen for an, being an admiral in like right before Nautilus launched, the Navy skipped over him twice. They were like, nope, he's not admiral. We don't like that. Like he was such an asshole. Like people just absolutely hated him. And he, he would have been, I mean, people had threatened to court martial him probably appropriately like many times, but because he had built these friends in high places and Congress really liked him at this point. Congress actually intervened and like called a special session to like make him an admiral, which if they hadn't done, he wouldn't have, um, he would he, he would have been forced retired. Yeah, there's a, and there's a bunch of other stories along those lines, like little tiny things that could have not happened that would have changed the overall way it went down. Like that when he got assigned to that submarine, he applied for the submarine way back. He got rejected. And as he was walking out of the office, he passed his old commander from the this other battleship who was like, well, you got rejected. And he went back and was like, no, you got to take this guy. It's like just this total coincidence. Serendipity. Eh? Yeah. OK, yeah. so anyway. so I want to mix I want to mix like the kind of uh, assessments of character alongside like nerding out on some nuclear stuff. So maybe could we take a brief diversion to just talk about we're going to talk about shipping port and his role there. But. You know, a lot of people talk about, hey, like in the Australian debate, for instance, like, you know, SMRs are not so crazy. Like there's hundreds of them, you know, floating around, uh, you know, or not necessarily floating under the ocean. Um, and there's this idea, and I think it's very naive that, hey, you could just, you know, they're equivalent. You just take them and put them on land. Um, and to some degree, I think that's happened with the icebreaker program with the, uh, with the Russians, with the academic Lomasov. But how, how is it in particular, like a nuclear submarine PWR different um, than a, a land-based uh, power generation one in terms of, well, a whole bunch of different metrics. Yeah, well, um, first of all, the details of the submarine reactor are classified, so it's hard okay. to say. But I mean, one big change, one big, one huge difference is that it uses highly enriched uranium. They're total HEU, you know, not enriched uranium, like fully enriched uranium. Like bomb, you can make a bomb out of it. Yeah, well, I mean, you'd have to like re, yes, you'd have to melt it back down and form it into a sphere. But yeah, it could. So I mean, a big, a big sort of talking point in terms of just basic nuclear advocacy comms is a civilian nuclear power plant cannot blow up like a nuclear bomb. I guess the submarine can't either because of the architecture of the fuel, but it is essentially 90% bomb grade. High yeah, enriched. or more. Yeah, some people say it's fully enriched, whatever that means. <laughs> so right. It's like 100% right. enriched. Um, but yes, it, it's not going to, no, it's not in a supercritical configuration. It can't blow up like a nuclear bomb unless you melted it all down, refabricated it into a sphere and put a, you know, and then shot it with a cannon a into it. Yeah, so it's yeah. not going to like, the subs aren't going to blow up, but um, the material itself is certainly weapons grade. Uh, material. So the fuels is very different. That does allow you to be very, very small. And so that makes you nice and compact um, and still be critical and run for a very long time, you know, 30 years at full power. So in terms of like longevity and compactness, highly enriched uranium gives a massive advantage there. But on a for a land-based reactor, you know, you can be much bigger. And since you're bigger, the neutrons don't leak out as much. And so you can reduce that enrichment, which is why we can be we can have big power reactors that are just five or less. Also, also why I guess a lot of SMR designs, like at the more micro scale, um, you know, certainly benefit from, if not require halo. Is that correct? In yes, terms of neutron yes, economy? yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. And so the other thing I've heard is is the sort of extraordinary power excursions. Uh, maybe excursion is the wrong word, but like you can, you know, it's imp very important in the uh, naval applications to be able to dial up power output and go from zero to, to I'm not sure how many knots is the max speed, but go from zero to whatever that is in very short time intervals. Yes, they. I mean, they're very maneuverable. I mean, any even a. a a regular pressurized water reactor can load follow pretty quickly if you want. There's specifications. I mean, they're all designed to load follow at like three ish percent per full power per minute, which is a lot. Wow. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, tens of megawatts per minute. Um, but um, yeah, they can do much more in a, a HEU reactor. Like there's this idea of um, like xenon poisoning, where if you go from high power to low power, like the xenon um, fission product will keep you poisoned for a while until it kind of goes away. And so it can be hard to come back to power for a, a lower enriched uranium reactor, but a high enriched uranium reactor can overpower that uh, no problem. So they, yes, they can, they can ramp up and down very quickly. They're very flexible. They're very, and again, you know, Rickover had this this battle. He had seen all these battle damage things. Like this reactor isn't designed for like a normal day at the power plant. It's designed to like operate continuously well under attack from another very powerful military. So they're they're super robust. And that's another kind of interesting thing about the PWR is like PWR is beefy because 
it has pressurized high pressure water in it. It's also conveniently beefy, which makes it like robust against battle conditions. So it's it's an interesting fit. Uh, that's just another sort of side note about PWRs being good for mm-hmm. submarines. But yeah, I mean, oh, other than that, like the core is different for sure. The rest of the systems are similar. I mean, a lot of them. Uh, well, they, and they've built all different generations of submarine reactors. They did some that were natural circulation without pumps. Pumps make noise, um, uh, but pumps also make the reactor higher performance. So it's like a trade-off. So they've played around with different uh, elements there. Um, you can go, like the steam can go directly to power the the screw um, instead of like converting power to electricity, but also you have generators in there to make electricity for the house loads of the, of the ship. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're, they're relatively, they're similar ish, but I I mean, there's differences that like, we just don't know that are, you know, on different systems and stuff, but overall, like the concept is like very similar. Uh, The PWR is the PWR, different core, different fuel. Right. Well, maybe this is a moment then to bridge over uh, to land and talk about uh, Rickover's role in, in shipping port. And and again, like Rick, I find like Rickover is kind of like, I mean, certainly loved and hated in a, in a whole number of different fields. But there is sort of a narrative of like Rickover, the villain who committed us to these shitty, you know, so-called wet PWR reactors. Uh, the only reason we did that is because of, you know, the nuclear Navy's needs. And he sort of poisoned the well for all the other really cool advanced stuff um, that's just around the corner. Uh, so let's let's talk about shipping port kind of in that context. Yeah. Um, so that and that actually. So <laughs> yes, that's that concern um, was raised back then, like back when. So like at the time, I mean, there was a proposal in the um, or late '40s for the Atomic Energy Commission to get into commercial power development, and they had. But meanwhile, they also had like an aircraft carrier project that they were working on. Um, but when Eisenhower came to power later on in the, I guess, early fifties, he was supposed to cancel, he was supposed to reduce the budget. The budget was too high. So the aircraft carrier project was a casualty. It was canceled. Um, but then Eisenhower said, well, wait a minute, if we could turn that into a civilian power plant, like I'd support it. So it was like allow, it would have been able to come back if it was focused on civilian, uh, civilian power. And so there was this push to be like, well, we could have Rickover do it because Rickover can get stuff done. And they really wanted to demonstrate that we could have a land-based power plant. Other countries, I mean, the Soviets were running a power plant, uh, a commercial power plant, small one. And the and the UK had Calder Hall running already. It was making plutonium, but it was also making utility power. And so we were way behind and we were freaking out about not having. So the idea was like, well, let's just have Rick over do a PWR because we know it's going to work. Like he's already had all the success um, on the on the naval reactors. But the, a lot of people in the Atomic Energy Commission were like, hell no, and like, A, those reactors will never be economical because they don't breed fuel. They will, we had, at the time, remember, uranium was very scarce. And so they thought, like, the fuel scarcity, which we're all using for our weapons production, is going to be a major problem. And also, like, um, that if we just do the PWR, Rickover, like, is going to steamroll all these other great reactors that we have been developed. I mean, even back then, there were programs to develop power reactors for like organic cooled reactors, molten salt reactors, high temperature gas, sodium cooled fast reactors like Fermi and sodium cooled graphite moderated reactors like Hallam and and sodium reactor experiment were all in progress at this time. And so there was fear that like if Rickover does it, it's just gonna be PWRs forever. And that's kind of like what happened. Um, so he anyway, he was eventually given that project and he took control of it. Um, there were three. It was Naval Reactors plus Rickover. Bettis Lab did all the design, fabrication, test, assembly of the heat transfer system. And then the utility, Duquesne, put in five million bucks for the for the plant des- or for the core design. And then they gave him the land, maintained it and bought the steam. That was kind of the deal. And they made it, it's kind of like, it's almost like an open source reactor. Like it was very done in the open. There's a whole book, you know, the like solid fuel reactors, fluid fuel reactors, volumes that like started uh, the thorium craze today. Those were all issued in the 1958 Adams for Peace Conference. Well, there's another one that's just shipping port. And there's this huge book about like all the design details, every little thing that went into shipping port. And they even did, they had like different steam generators came from totally different vendors. They got, uh, so that they were, it was the idea was like, well, let's try out these different vendors, steam generators. So they would put two in and they would do experiments to see which one performed better. It was intended to be a platform from which to launch the commercial nuclear industry. And it worked great. It was very reliable. They built it um, pretty much on budget. 
uh, and so on. It was very, it was well designed, very safe. Four barriers of radiation protection. It had a weird core. It was a seat and blanket core, kind of based on the the naval physicist guy. Um, but it was ten times more expensive than like a equivalent coal plant. So it was not commercial, but it was like a good demo that like this type of reactor goes well, and that did inspire that success. Certainly inspired the follow-on reactors that were PWRs, and they worked great. Also, they could ride on the supply chain. All those work that Rickover had done on the fuel form, on all the pipes, equipment, valves, all those vendors were set up. And meanwhile, all these other reactor experiments that were going on weren't, um, I mean, they they just didn't perform as well as the PWR. Like, they were definitely working on, again, the sodium systems, gas, and, and salt, and so on. They just, like, did not perform as well. They they had these reliability issues and they couldn't get through it. And remember, I mean, people say like, oh, Rick Over and the PWR is the only reason we have this. Well, Rick Over also did the sodium cooled reactor. Like, so it's mm-hmm. a, it's, you can't just say that argument and say like, he never tried advanced reactors because he did. He built two sodium cooled, brilliant moderated reactors, the prototype and the Seawolf. So like th- there is a, there's like some truth that he, you know, that head start was beneficial for the plant. But there's also, it must be said that the PWR truly outperformed in reliability and other types, other measures of performance, dozens of other types of reactors that were built uh, and just didn't stand up to the test. So that's something right, we, I've right. said before. I, <laughs> yeah, so. I can't remember if it was you or James Kronstein, but um, this idea that, you know, the PWR uh, and water cooled, uh, water moderated reactors build off of a, you know, 200 plus year legacy of, you know, using uh, pressure vessels and and steam as the working fluid, uh, you know, ever since the Industrial Revolution. And so a lot of the kinks and, you know, the experimentation uh, was there, whereas, you know, dealing with molten metals and molten salts, um, as you're saying, you know, the metallurgy is is very complex. Like we've, we've solved or had solved a lot of those problems. There's still more problems to solve, as you mentioned, with zirconium and things like that. But um, that to me, that was that's kind of a compelling common sense, you know, reason. And it's not to say these other ones can't develop and one day get there, but you know, you've got a two hundred year head start with um, their PWRs. I'm sure there's some truth to that, but I mean, this idea that like the high temperature, high pressure water was pretty unique. Like, not too many people were running pumps and valves in a high temperature, high pressure water environment, so they did have to do that stuff, the the corrosion and that other development. But I mean, still, like, yes, water is a much more familiar uh, material, and then but. Yeah, I will say that, like, yes, um, so the PWRs did did pretty well overall just inherently. But there's also, like, some inspiration for the advanced... I don't want to just <laughs> crap on advanced reactor development. After all, I'm an advanced reactor developer myself. I obviously believe in that stuff. But um, the other thing, I think it's inspiring to see that, like, Rickover did stand in the face of all this opposition. Everybody said, you're crazy. You'll never build a reactor in five years. Like, it can't be done. Don't be dumb. And he's like, I'll do it. And he, like rolled up his sleeves. He like came to, he like forced himself into positions of power. He had a joint position at the Atomic Energy Commission and at the Navy where he was like the head of both. He just, he like maneuvered his way to power and then he just like powered through and just made it happen. So like, it is kind of interesting um, that like, if it's sort of this, if you set your mind to it and work your ass off, he never, he worked every Saturday. Like he never stopped working. He was kind of a total workaholic. Um, and he had this huge team of, of this cult that would follow him. And they were able to do something that was basically considered impossible, which was truly awesome. And then, yeah, they went on and did the, they did surface ships. They did eventually the carriers. They did a couple of battleships, um, the Long Beach. And, and then they did the, the, the power, the whole nuclear power industry came out of shipping port. And then later on, they did, they converted the shipping port to a light water breeder reactor with thorium, like a totally crazy, this was the, this was the backup plan for the U.S., fast breeder reactor program. He was like, well, if you're going to do fast reactor breeders, because breeders are important for the future of um, fuel sustainability, you might want to have a backup plan with a reactor that you know works. He kind of like still was skeptical about sodium cooled reactors. And so they converted shipping port over to this like breeder reactor with thorium and proved that it could breed. It wasn't a great breeder, but it, it worked. It like could breed and could have like really good fuel sustainability so that was like another thing he did way late in his life we're gonna have to wrap up fairly shortly but uh, you know a couple curiosities um and this is from wikipedia so i don't know how reliable it is but um was rickover a radiophobe um he was asked at one point if he had regrets um you know i think and just more broadly about nuclear power and he said like i do not believe that nuclear power is worth it if it creates radiation every time you produce radiation you produce something that has a certain half-life in some cases billions of years it is important that we control these forces and try to eliminate them 
that to me was kind of shocking because you think he's someone who should understand that understand relative risks and understand the world is naturally radioactive what what's going on there yeah i mean this is that's from his retirement hearing in like 84 and yeah there's a bunch of stuff in there um he one of his main principles was like respect even very small amounts of radiation like he Mm -hmm. like he considered he says in there as well you know he considered it a necessary evil you know to fight the the ruskies at the time but no, I mean, that's one of the reasons maybe like the nuclear industry doesn't champion Rick over all that much is that it, later in his life, he came out and said, you know, we should, he, he was worried that we were going to annihilate ourselves with nuclear weapons, which, you know, after he thought about it, he's probably right. That is one of our major risks right now. But then he also said like, so let's ban nuclear weapons and let's ban nuclear reactors. Like he was against nuclear power at that time. I will say in that particular quote, he said he doesn't, given the current benefits, um, I don't consider it worth it. I will say the current benefits have kind of changed since then because now we have this like more existential risk of things like climate change and like air pollution. And those weren't risks that were being considered at that time. So who knows? Like he's, he may change his mind, but he was sort of opposed to um, expansion of nuclear power at the end of his career. Didn't Weinberg also have like some critical things to say towards the end as well? Maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, well, Weinberg always was sort of the... He always was supportive of nuclear. He always believed in like a nuclear powered future. Um, he did say things like, I mean, he called nuclear power a, a deal with the devil, a Faustian bargain. And uh, he sort of became like the conscience of the nuclear advocates that would, you know, people, they, the antis would talk to him and he would give it to him like, like, can a PWR cause an accident? He'd be like, well, yeah, like here's some reports or like a reactor, you know, he cut it, and he described like TMI and, and Fukushima type incidents that were possible. And like some people in the industry didn't like, you know, people don't like hearing realities like that. But, um, but no, Weinberg's I'd say was, was much more positive overall. And by the way, Weinberg like hated Rick over because <laughs> he was <laughs> such surprised. a, he was such a jerk. I, I mean, again, it, to, to explain sort of Rick over's uh, sense of, you know, ideally we put the genie back in the bottle, obviously, you know, nuclear war, but he, he literally invented the platform through which, you know, the ultimate nuclear delivery system, which is this undetectable intercontinental ballistic missile launching yeah. submarine with, I think Alex Wellerstein was saying, you know, fully loaded, uh, could deliver 90 megatons um, of punishment and essentially wipe out a country with, you know, one single vessel. I mean, that, that, it's, that it's, possibility. yeah, with like Mervs. I mean, I think you could take it like all of Europe. Like it's, I mean, it's, um, they are terrifying. I mean, the, the capability of, the, like a sub platform with a bunch of intercontinental blissing missiles with like multiple targets is like it is terrifying like it's when you think about it um yeah and there's a book coming out soon that i'll recommend um that kind of covers this but like it's it is truly yeah the, the whole nuclear weapon posture thing is i mean in terms of exis- existential threats and now we have more and more issues growing in the world conflicts between nuclear armed people there's like five of them going on right now like it's it's a you're if you want to list the existential risks that we're facing, like that's very high on the list. And so like I don't I don't disagree with Rick over in his later days after he's sitting here thinking about it, it's like he knows the full capabilities, he knows all the close calls, and he's sitting here, he's kind of thinking like, geez, we're he the in that same speech where that quote came from. I do recommend his retirement hearing. It's very uh, we should put a link to it or something. But he says like He's like, oh, I'm pretty sure we're going to vaporize all, we're all going to kill ourselves and some other species will come along and hopefully it'll be smarter than us. Like that, he became like really cynical and kind of, you know, depressed in his old age. And again, like he's probably, there's reason to be cynical with like that much nuclear weaponry. Um, I'm like disappointed that he wasn't an optimist about nuclear power, civilian electricity, which we all think in know is like a really good solution. But from the weapon side of things, I mean, I kind of agree with him. Yeah, yeah. I guess what, one thing I feel like we sort of hinted at but didn't fully cover, maybe we did, um, is just sort of, again, how cool nuclear submarines are and what their what their capabilities are. This is like an awkward time to work it into the discussion, but just, can you say, even just the Nautilus, like what did the sure. Nautilus yeah, do? Yeah, and like immediately, like, like as soon as it turned on, so like, um, it, like there's a famous moment where it, it started going away and it flat, it signaled underway on nuclear power. And it actually did that with, um, Morse code through a light. It was like light signaling underway on nuclear power. And immediately it like went off to the Caribbean or something. It broke every record for submarines on its first journey. Like, uh, you know, speed, depth, um, how long it was underwater and everything. It like broke every single record day one. And then, yeah, they went on all sorts of grand adventures, um, 
soon after, like, yeah, they did this surprise. It was a stunt where they went from, you know, the Pacific Ocean under the sea, under the Arctic Ocean, under the sea, under the ice for the first time and showed up in like London in the North Sea. And that like blew everybody's mind. And it was like a totally new type of um, uh, a route you could do and just changed the ideas of any sea war uh, completely. And then, yeah, it it wasn't the one, um, it wasn't the Nautilus, but like one of the second or third, the third reactor, the Skipjack, I think, um, did the circumnavigation submerged, which no one wow. had ever done. So they, and they actually did, they like went under and they did a full circumnavigation. Of so how, like how long did it take and how much food did, because again, food seems to be the rate limiting thing. Food uh, for the crew. Yeah, I want to say, I think it was like 60 to 80 days. I can't remember the exact number, but it was like, it was like three wow. months or something like that. It didn't, it wasn't super fat. They weren't going full bore, but um, right. yeah, you can have, they, they apparently can put that much food on there. Um, yeah. And can't they go fishing? I don't know. <laughs> <Is there a laughs> system for that? Or yeah, grab a send whale. Them out through the, send them out through the torpedo chute. Yeah, uh, I have no like idea. The special forces do. Okay, well, I, yeah, again, I think a great place to wrap it up. Um, in terms of, again, I mean, I've, I've read most of the paper reactor uh, memo. But maybe some like closing thoughts. Like we are, we are in in a, in a certain. It does feel like a new age. The last ten or fifteen years, um, there hasn't really been the opportunity there was to really build that much. There's been a scattering of projects in Europe and Vogel, obviously, but it's been yeah. you know really a moment in time of um, paper reactor companies. Um, you know, basically <laughs> verbatim <laughs> speaking from from this memo. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we saw with recent developments, uh, Google partnering with Kairos, Amazon partnering with X Energy, um, you know, like just maybe just some kind of commentary on where we are at in the current moment and whether there's some kind of wisdom to be uh, derived from from Rick over. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like the, the first part of this memo is about inspiring interest and in getting funding. And like that's important, like getting people interested and excited is important, but also facing facts and being realistic is important because. We don't want to just get funding for nuclear. We want to also deliver real, reliable, performance systems. And so in order to do that, we have to be realistic up front and still be excited and tell people the, the capabilities that we think we can get. But we have to say what's really what it's really going to take. And um, one of the ways to know that better and the thing that we should be doing more is what Rick Hover always pushed for since his shock testing days, which is detailed analysis, full-scale mock-ups, elaborate and intense testing of the real systems and just get and getting that operational experience like and a lot of the you know the 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 paper reactor companies have gotten serious about it and they're building big experimental facilities and running significant experiments and i think i think the lesson is basically we need a lot more of that we need that that uh, national reactor testing station back we need to be building and operating reactors and and really serious mm-hmm. tests and just like getting that on the ground experience with physical hardware, getting the the reliability of, yeah, oh cool, your core can burn nuclear waste or whatever, but how reliable are your valves? Who's selling your valves? If I throw the valve at the radiator, is it gonna <laughs> like what's gonna happen? So I think just like getting past the 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 excite the sort of show and tell paper type stuff and just getting into hardware, getting into tests is like how we're gonna be able to move forward. But and then the last inspiration is as I already mentioned, it can be done. Like if you put your mind to it and you work hard and you really try, you can do things even that people say are impossible today. It's probably possible. And if you put that time in and effort and do that testing and be realistic, like you can make it happen. I guess just like my my closing reflection, um, and I always like to seize the last word because I'm, uh, you know, I'm an ungracious host. But um, you know, uh, Rickover's uh, preoccupation with the education system. Um, I always bring it back when when thinking about nuclear. We get you know wowed by the shiny metallic parts in the nuclear steam supply system. We often forget about the the drudgery of of digging or <laughs> the excavations and pouring the concrete. But I think the most fundamental thing we forget about is the human factors. Um, and the sort of best of the best, why not the best, I think, is a Rick over quote in terms of, uh, you know, uh, his uh, his uh, recruitment strategy. But, you know, are we, you know, we have this kind of hubris of the now or because we have AI and sophisticated compute um, and they had slide rules, you know, well, we can do anything or we can do better than them. But I do feel like, you know, just this this character study and he might be just such an incredible anomaly. Um, illustrates a little bit sort of the human factors that are required to make things happen. And, you know, I'm in touch with um, uh, 
well, it's Ken Petrunik who delivered the the Candu project, uh, most recent bills in Chin Chan China, and like that caliber of human being uh, is exceptionally rare. Um, that skill set, and you know, I'm, I'm yet to interview Ken, but like that that formation in terms of their education, et cetera, I think is something really worthy of of study and a, and a probably a rate limiting step that we're not adequately focused on. Yeah, and I know you said it was your last word, but I mean, yeah, that uh, this, this last thing that Rick was also says that the leaders must be extremely concerned with the details. Like you must, you can't just send people off to do. It. You have to be every day, like looking at the elaborate, the hardest problem that's going on. Like the leadership has to really care because then the people under the leadership are also going to really care. And that setting that example and having that competence being essential on the leadership side is another really interesting sort of Rick over aspect that I think carries over to exactly what you're saying. All right, Nick, we could we could talk all day. Thanks again for joining us. Again, listeners, uh, do me a big solid. Please uh, jump on Substack, subscribe, pledge. Um, similarly, get on YouTube. Um, we are going to be doing a studio upgrade. I, I currently podcast out of my son's bedroom, hence the floral arrangement behind me and the uh, planet glow in the dark stickers on the ceiling here. Um, you know, in the YouTube era, you know, people demand something a little better than this. So um, if you are interested in making a larger donation to help fund that, uh, that would be absolutely amazing. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, everybody, please help do your part to make Decouple truly a sustainable entity as we you know, imagine a much more exciting future for this, uh, this media enterprise. With that, uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, Nick, uh, planning on having you back. You don't know it yet, uh, but definitely want to chat micro reactors. Um, there's, there's a lot I want to get into with you. Um, you're, you're a wonderful guest. Um, Appreciate it. Sayonara. Great. All right. Thanks. It was a great time. Take care. Cheers.